All right. Welcome, everyone. It's really good uh, to see all of you here today. My name is Hanna, Hanna van den Bos, and I am from Studium Generale. We organize all kinds of activities, also like this one, um, on topics that matter. And you can see some on the screens on there. We will also have more events coming up for November, so uh, be sure to check our website as well. Um, and it's also good to know that we have uh, a certificate that you can get as a student from, from Tilburg University, um, for which you have to visit five of our events, uh, write a small report about it, and uh, give your own uh, personal reflection about it, and then uh, you can get the certificate, actually. Uh, if you're interested, please check out our website as well. Um, but I'm not alone today in organizing this event. I'm really pleased to invite Julia on the floor uh, from AI Forward Forum. Judita, who's sitting there, is also from AI Forward Forum, and they will tell a little bit more about who they are and what they do. So, please. Good afternoon. It's really nice to see you all here in the flesh. Um, so, about the AI Forward Forum. Is this moving? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, these days we hear so much about artificial intelligence, but we don't uh, often hear about those who are behind creating it. Um, and here's a question to you. So actually, um, who do you think are the, the fields or areas that are important for creating a general purpose AI systems? So those systems that are supposed to be reaching uh, human level intelligence. And really this is the uh, question for audience participation. So if you can just raise your hand and, and shout out uh, what do you think who are the people who are, uh, what sort of areas are important? Anyone? Yeah? Uh -huh. Yeah, so we hear psychology, cognitive science. Um, any more answers uh, other than these? Uh, okay, but I think that's uh, that's a good start. Um, um, so indeed, psychology, cognitive science, um, art, we think, uh, law. So many, actually, we think many areas. And how this idea came about, so a little uh, more than a year ago, we started this initiative, uh, AI Forward Forum. With this thinking uh, uh, or idea in mind that um, developing AI systems uh, should go beyond just the involvement of computer scientists, uh, ML engineers, or neuroscientists, that actually it requires uh, concerted efforts from a range of domains, so cutting across the science, the humanities, and arts. Uh, so everyone's involvement is vital. And um, we also think that there are societal implications to this because uh, would you rather have uh, AI systems developed by a small group of people or be it a societally driven process? Um, so all these ideas were simmering in our heads and then we started AI Forward Forum as a platform for different people to come together to um, exchange ideas uh, related to artificial intelligence and ideally to come up with uh, a set of new ideas, uh, a roadmap that could be useful uh, when developing uh, general purpose AI systems. So what we do in practical terms, um, we uh, organize an online talk series um, that takes place every month and to which we have been inviting uh, a, a bunch of uh, prominent speakers all across uh, a range of domains, so psychology, cognitive science, computer scientists, uh, science, um, uh, design, uh, philosophy, uh, you name it. And um, 
also the geography of speakers is very wide, so uh, the United States, but also European countries, uh, Sweden, the Netherlands, of course, uh, the UK, uh, France, and so on. And um, uh, here also on the slide, you can get a taste of what's coming up still this autumn. So a talk on uh, game AI and uh, quantum computing. And if you would like to know uh, more about this initiative, you can go to AIforwardForum.com to check out the recordings of previous talks uh, and some associated uh, resources. Um, you can just subscribe to our newsletter and hopefully uh, join uh, this growing community. So um, that much about AI Forward Forum. All right, then I will take over again. Uh, really check them out. I think they do uh, really interesting talks uh, online. So uh, yeah, definitely uh, visit one. Um, all right, so today, of course, you saw the title, The Technological uh, Future of Food and Farming. Quite a title, I think. <laughs> and But d what do we want to actually uh, discuss today? Well, of course, you have uh, big debates going on today about food scarcity, climate change, but also the recent uh, Dutch farmers protest, actually. Um, they really make you think about what the future of our food production will look like. Um, and then really the question that is raised a lot, I think, is saying, can uh, technological innovation solve everything or are there other steps to take as well? That's a debate you hear a lot. Um, Thinking further uh, about these questions, we have invited three speakers uh, today who will uh, tell something uh, about this. First, we will start uh, with Owen Visser, um, and then we will have a case study talk by Amanda Carsten. There will be then after the second uh, lecture, we will have a 10 minute break. And then we will end with uh, the third uh, case study talk by Julia Kepler, and then end with a 15 minute interactive Q&A, where we also really want you to um, yeah, participate, ask any questions that you may have. And um, this interactive Q&A will be moderated by Julia and uh, Judita, who you just saw. Um, okay, then I think it's time to introduce the first speaker. Uh, am I pronouncing it right? Own? On? Sorry. <laughs> uh, On a Visser. Uh, he's an associate professor from Erasmus University in Rotterdam. Um, and his research interests lie in new digital technologies, large scale farming, and also the financialization of agriculture. And for today, he will actually tell us more about the current developments in agriculture technology and also connected to bigger issues that we're seeing right now in our society. So please give a big applause for Orne. Thank you for the invitation to speak here. It's a nice setting here in theater. I uh, have been doing, when I was a PhD student, I was doing uh, improvisation theater. So it's nice to be back on uh, more like a theater stage uh, rather than a lecture room. Um, so, yeah, here's mine. Um, so I will talk uh, especially about uh, the processes of digitalization technology in the form of uh, new digital technologies, which are uh, increasingly um, entering the space of agriculture and, and food. Um, technology is sometimes seen as a solution to a lot of problems which are kind of uh, haunting um, uh, agriculture in the Netherlands and all, all, lots of other countries. Um, yesterday a new report was, uh, as m uh, many of you will know, a report was uh, presented about the nitrogen crisis and we had a very heated summer both in terms of temperature and in terms of a uh, farmer protest. Eh? Uh, so, um, yeah, there is a lot of debate about the challenges which, are, which agriculture is currently facing. And uh, a big part of that debate is whether, yeah, new technologies can be a solution to address um, 
the problems and especially the environmental problems of agriculture. Uh, so the current food system, both here in the Netherlands, in Europe, but globally also, uh, faces a lot of uh, problems, uh, mounting problems, which come more and more aware, uh, not only to scientists, but also increasingly aware to farmers themselves, to the broader audience. So we have a whole range in, when we think about environmental challenges. We have water and soil pollution. We have soil degradation. Part of my research was in Russia and Ukraine. There you have the very fertile black soils, but even they are not as fertile already anymore as they once were. They seem like infinitely uh, fertile. And the same is for the most fertile ground in, uh, for example, Flavorland, uh, which is diminishing. So then we have the large footprint of global food transport. Uh, yeah, we, we are importing uh, strawberries in winter from, uh, from uh, Morocco and Kenya and flowers. Um, recent studies just last year showed that we have been underestimating even that footprint. It is it's bigger than we thought. Uh, then there is increasing, uh, decreasing effectiveness of chemicals. Yeah, we see especially in the US where uh, there has been much more even uh, uh, use of chemicals than in, in the EU, that there is growing wheat resistance of all kinds of uh, wheat. Uh, resistance against uh, those chemicals is increasing. Uh, we see the rise of animal diseases just this week. Um, it was announced that all the, the chickens, yeah, the poultry has to be locked up because the new uh, bird flu uh, risk. And it's just, we have, it, it's just calmed down and the, the new uh, diseases are already coming, yeah? And, and we have had the discussion about the corona and animal diseases and that interlinkage. So there are risks also to not only to um, animals and the environment, but also to human health. Then there are the pathogens like the oil sector in, in, in southern Italy. One of my PhDs is doing research there. Um, hectares and hectares and kilometers, kilometers of of, uh, of um, oil, um, um, the oil production of the, in, in, in the south, uh, uh, where trees are um, destroyed by pathogens. And uh, monoculture is one of the, 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 the reasons for that. Uh, so we see, of course, the debate about uh, agriculture um, as a large contributor to climate change. It's estimated that roughly some quarter of global greenhouse gas emissions are originating from agriculture and especially from the, the livestock sector. And then of course, the, uh, the nitrogen crisis. So those are the environmental uh, challenges, but then we have also the economic challenges, yeah? So we have had, after the world war, the building up of the European and the US food system, where food was increasingly cheaper. And we have seen that we as a Dutch citizens over the past decades, uh, as a percentage, had to, to spend less and less uh, money on food comparatively yeah, to other costs, which is a luxury. It is very much the question whether that is sustainable yeah, for the coming years. Um, and we see that um, yeah, the, all kinds of efficiencies have been introduced and the profits have been squeezed out and the margins for most of the farmers have decreased. So we see a lot of farmers complaining yeah, about we have to introduce even more uh, regulations, but from which uh, money should we do that? Because we, uh, many already uh, are below the minimum weights. At the same time, there are also some uh, farmer millionaires. So there's also this problem of inequality. Uh, but economically, at least for the past 10, 15 years, uh, there has been growing uh, concern also in this area. Yeah? Is, it, is this our model of conventional agriculture, is it economically even viable? Um, and then it's socially, yeah? We, there was also, we, as, as citizens, we had uh, the security of oversupply even, of, uh, especially in, in, in Europe, yeah? of oversupply of food and cheap food. Yeah? And then like in 2006, 2007, there was this major hike in food prices. Maybe you remember that. Um, and then there were all kinds of food protests. Yeah, uh, In Madagascar, uh, a government fell because of that. 
there were big uh, there was this tendency of land grabs which I'll discuss. Uh, so food suddenly wasn't so so low priced anymore and, and not so and stable prices uh, started to finish. Then we entered re-entered a, a, sh a relatively short period of more stability. And now with the Ukraine crisis, we see increasingly again yeah, that food prices, not only in the global south, not only in developing countries, but also in the west are starting to rise. Yeah? And it seems that those cr crises in food, this food crisis become a kind of the new normal. Yeah? That it's, it's uh, hard to, to talk anymore about events, uh, incidents. It is becoming more of a pattern, yeah? this huge volatility. And that's all also related to our system of how we do food, like conventional, large scale, with very much export driven. Um, when we had the previous food crisis, like 2006, 2007, yeah, um, the, 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 the kind of on the global level, the response was to cope with this volatility, this rising food prices, the instability in the food system. The way to cope was that basically in the global north, yeah, here we kind of postponed measures forward, did some like window dressing uh, uh, kind of um, actions, and there was a big move to, yeah, say, okay, the margins are going down, environmental problems, we just moved to the global south where there is supposedly lots of abandoned or unused land, yeah, and labor is cheap, land is cheap, so there was the idea we will feed the world by moving uh, there. So we had this, this big trend of uh, transnational land investment or land grabbing, uh, which I studied and many colleagues um, over the world. And basically it was the same model, just spreading out, yeah? Um, basically also exporting the problems to other areas. And, and that was often unsuccessful, so there were a lot of biofuels which appeared not to be a viable model. Um, there was a mit mismatch often in crops and agroecological conditions, rural systems, corruption, so lots of reasons why a lot of products fi projects failed. So now we are hitting another food crisis, yeah? So the move to the global south appeared not to be a super uh, good uh, solution. So now the new yeah, kind of magic bullet is uh, technological innovation, yeah? both in meat, etc. But I will focus on the, yeah, the digitalization of agriculture as, as the, the new hope. Um, so um, a lot, there's a lot of talk about an emerging or already ongoing digital revolution in agriculture. Um, especially in, in the global north, here in Europe, the US, uh, but there is also very much the idea that the green revolution, yeah, which was taking place in, in, the, in the global south in the 50s and the 60s, introduction of, uh, of pesticides and fertilizer, basically, and some tractors sometimes, uh, that didn't take off really in, agri in Africa, and now the idea is that um, this huge potential of Africa and some parts of the global south could suddenly be brought uh, very actively in production uh, with a new green revolution, but then this time a digital green revolution. Yeah? So this is all built on the, the, the progress, technological progress, which has been happening in the past uh, 10, 15 years in terms of uh, internet, not just something being which something we encounter in our computer, but which can uh, enters and penetrates our life through all kinds of sensors, yeah? So and that has also been happening in agriculture. You have uh, sensors um, mounted to milk robots, onto cows in the soil, on uh, combines, and um, big um, progress in terms of precision with satellites, the rise of smartphones, Th these are key developments with which now um, uh, potentially at least uh, enable uh, uh, this kind of new uh, digital uh, agrarian revolution. Um, I'll just show you a few pictures to give you a sense of 
new developments across yeah, the food chain and then I will zoom in more in uh, the farm, yeah, on the farm uh, side. So um, in farming we see uh, the appearance of, of robots, uh, also harvesting robots, here a pepper robot uh, developed uh, by research from Wageningen. Um, lots of this horticultural robots, they are still in a trial state, but some are already a bit in the commercial state. Um, then there are increasingly drones I use to monitor the seizures in crops here across the fields, sometimes to spray pesticides. Then uh, on the level of food trade, global food trade, you see that uh, food traders like Cargill, those big transnational food traders, they increasingly try to have a, a global overview and a almost real-time overview of, of all the food streams across the world. Yeah? And that is being enabled by new technologies. Uh, blockchain is increasingly introduced. Then in retail we see, this is still rare, but this is in California, a US uh, pizza bot with prepares your pizza. Um, this is already more common, yeah. Uh, automated checkout in supermarkets and this is also uh, uh, already starting to come quite common, yeah, the platform economy, food delivery. Then zooming in a bit more into uh, farming, yeah, the farm level. Uh, th this new digitalization of agriculture goes by different names. It's sometimes called smart farming, precision farming, digital farming, uh, the different definitions. Um, and I think it will be interesting to show you uh, a bit of the, the view of the proponents of digital agriculture, yeah? Uh, how it's, it's seen by some of the tech providers, yeah? And then I will go into some of the, um, yeah, the other sides, more critical sides, limitations. Yeah, this is fine, yeah. So there will be two very short um, uh, little movies. These are basically ads by uh, KPN, yeah, the telecom company. Oh, there's no. It worked so well. Just... Ah, yeah. yeah. So that was the first one, and then another one also uh, by the telecom company, KPN. Very brief one. He, it, unfortunately, it's it, for the foreigners. It's just in Dutch. We can actually. Hebben wolken smorgens rode randen. Altijd is er wind en nat voor handen. No, nee hoor. Een zuidwesten windkracht 3 en maar 10% kans op neerslag. Prima weer om te zaaien. Internet net zo mobiel als jij. Maar ik ben er wel mooie wolken. Voor generatie KPN. Hey. Maybe someone who has an impression, a response about what kind of picture of... 
digital agriculture you get or what kind of emotions or feelings that it, it evokes? Any, uh... yeah. To me, um, any? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's like you can just stay in bed. Uh, normally as a farmer, you have to go up at six o'clock and it's cold and uh, short night. And now you just lie in bed with your ta tablet and a lot of done, uh, work is done for you. Yeah, so this is the idea of convenience. And also, yeah, the, the, second, the second movie, what kind of a message does it send about uh, agriculture, uh, a, a digital agriculture, the use of of smartphones in response. Um, I think it, it's very much to me, it, it's, it gives this idea of precision, yeah? So the farmer, it's all intuition based and it's also an old farmer, like this idea, it's outdated knowledge, yeah? And then you have the, the digital world at your fingertips and suddenly you get a super precise answers, yeah? And you basically, uh, the farmer knowledge is also a bit uh, kind of discredited here in my uh, perspective, yeah? Um, so that brings me to two questions uh, about this new technology. So we see some of the pro proposed benefits here, but will it likely be to the benefit of the farmer? Yeah, um, is it really like that? Like more productive? We have the problem with a lot of young people not wanting to go into agriculture. Are you now suddenly thinking like, okay, I leave my, my, uh, my office and I, uh, I'm, I'm going to the field to become a farmer. Um, and is it good for sustainability? Yeah? I will focus mostly at the first, a few things about the last, because the other speakers I think will talk more about the last point, about sustainability. So I'll focus more on the social economic sides, political sides of it. Uh, so the question is, is there, yeah, about precision, imprecision of these new technologies, empowerment, or is it disempowerment? This is the first topic I will discuss, and then I will go uh, uh, into the, uh, the, the, the aspect of the data, yeah, data surveillance and the risk of that and data capture. Um, so I will focus a little bit on uh, one aspect of, of agriculture technology because there are so many here, yeah? uh, and that's in arable farming, where there is this, uh, this currently increasingly uh, popular uh, idea of, uh, of technology of yield mapping. What is that? So the idea is that uh, data becomes very central to the work of the, far of the farmer, say a farmer who has... Uh, uh, potatoes or, or wheat, say. And um, the idea is that before you start planning, yeah, in the you, 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 you base your work not on, the, on your experience from the last year, but on prescription maps generated by software, yeah, which give all kinds of uh, very precise um, uh, advice of how much you should apply, how much fertilize, of how much seed in a particular spot in your field, yeah? So, supposedly very precise, and then you do different actions across the season, yeah? Along the circle, like seeding. The, and then as a farmer, what you do, you do some action, but every time, ideally, at the same time, you gather data, yeah? So you're both doing your agriculture work and sending data into the cloud, yeah? Um, so your soil sensing while you're seeding, you're uh, fertilizing and then getting, uh, collecting uh, also data. And then on top, I will focus most on that. Uh, when, once you are harvesting the wheat, for example, with the combine, that combine registers how much uh, per square meter uh, you harvest. Yeah? So you can see like, oh, I got a lot of grain from this part of the field and I go get a, less, a lot less from this part. So why is that? And then ideally, in, the computer can do its work and give you advice for the next year, like you should, should 
uh, should have done it otherwise. Yeah? And for next season, you have to apply a bit more fertilizer there or um, do other treatments. Yeah? So that is the idea. So the idea that you become every year you become more and more precise based on the data. Then what is the practice uh, based on the research I've done with two colleagues? Um, farmers in the Netherlands, for example, but also in the UK and the US, they uh, widely report a lot of inaccuracies in this, in this, uh, this technology of yield uh, mapping. Yeah? So there are uh, also interviews with the designers of those devices. They, they admit that that's very uh, realistic. There could be an error rate of 10%. Yeah? So how would, you, would you go into a car which has a 10% error rate yeah? of not spotting a, a, a red light or so? 10% um, um, can be also the margin of, yeah, for a farmer, if you have 10% more production of making a good pro profit or not making a profit at all. Yeah? So 10% is quite a lot. So and here is a, a quote. Oh, by, by the way, there is a map. Yeah, generated about the field in the, there in, in the bottom top. And then you can see like the green spaces, there is a lot of yield, so that's good. And red is bad, so you should do something different. Yeah? Uh, but then there is a farmer who says that, here's a quote, it's strange, the quicker I drive during harvesting, the higher the final yield per hectare. Yeah? So suddenly, because he, he starts driving quicker, per meter is more more uh, harvest, which shouldn't be like that, of course. Um, so he says uh, the manufacturer should actually go back to the basis and field uh, uh, fix yield mapping. If the basis is not good, fine tuning is of little help. So there's been a lot of fine tuning, increasingly nice, nice maps, etc., and all kinds of functionalities. But if the data, yeah, is not good, then that doesn't help a lot. Um, here is another quote, but. Um, the, the, the gist of it is that it becomes very much real time, very quick data gathering, but also errors very quickly uh, are generated, yeah? um, lightning fast. Uh, so real time is nice, but it should be real time accuracy, yeah? not real time errors. Okay, how much? Okay. So driving speed, crop, weather, et cetera, they all affect, uh, uh, affect accuracy. So what we found is that basically it's not just the technology which ensures accuracy. You just plug in and do the work. There is a key role for the farmer in, in doing that, like calibrating sensors, having his or her own experience, like thinking, hey, this couldn't be true. I have to, to look into the data. I have to change the settings. So uh, a key role of the farmer yeah, to make, uh, make uh, digital technology in general accurate. Yeah? So, and that is in contrast with the idea of that technology is kind of inherent, super accurate um, um, uh, functions. Yeah? Uh, there was one uh, farmer who said, yeah, the combined tells the truth. Uh, that was a more optimistic farmer, some more, more uh, negative. And it also, it's, it, it, it is not, it uh, kind of problematizes the negative view of, of the farmer, like in one of those movies, like that the, the farmer is kind of the weakest component in, in agriculture, in digital agriculture, yeah? So farmers have an active role. They have to develop a feeling for error, what to look for when calibrating and using technologies. Yeah. Um, so going to the last part, uh, last, um, there is, there is a danger of being precisely inaccurate. Yeah? You, it looks very precise, but there are all kinds of errors hidden underneath. And then you are put at ease, like you you're so impressed as a farmer, okay, that should be good. And if you then not go to the field anymore to look yourself, be critical, uh, that could increase the failures, yeah? the chance for risks. So there is the danger of what we call a precision trap that you are so excited about the idea of sophistication. Uh, there are not any more checks and balances like looking, weighing, controlling, just with analog means. Yeah? The other aspect is data capture and surveillance. Um, the proponents say there is 
a lot of empowerment of the farmer, the world at his or her fingertips. Uh, yet farmers are not massively embracing uh, lots of new digital technology, a few selected ones. So one of the proponents said, it's strange, like every fund thinks digital agriculture is sexy, except the farmer himself. Yeah, so you have all those tech providers, consultants, they think that this is the future. And the farmers are saying, ho, ho. Um, so the question is, who will really benefit of this data-driven agriculture? Definitely a lot of the value lies in the data itself, yeah? A lot of uh, scientists about, social scientists, political scientists about data and the platform economy show data is the new gold, the new oil of the economy. But the farmers have to make the big investments. They are the producers of the data, yeah? So are we moving to a kind of surveillance farm, in the words of, of Klaus, where all kinds of people, except the farmer, are nudging the farmer what to do, yeah? And farm tr uh, food traders know exactly uh, oh, oh, the harvest coming up from the farmers, having a, an edge in negotiations, price negotiations. These are risks which are there, yeah? Um, the one case is of John Deere, those tractors are sealed, yeah, uh, digitally locked. So farmers normally can repair their tractors. They cannot do that. It's all locked, yeah, digitally. They need a stick with a code from the help desk somewhere in the city. Yeah, so when they're stuck in the middle of the prairie in, in the US uh, after the, the help desk has closed, yeah, and then they are standing there and they cannot do anything, yeah. And it might seem like since fiction, but John Deere can remotely disable and stop the combines they have sold to any farmer. Yeah, uh, maybe it, it, uh, a few years ago, or maybe now it seems uh, science fiction. But for example, the Russians, when they occupied Ukraine, I did a lot of research in that area. Uh, they stole quite a lot of combines, and then those John Deere combines they were digitally stopped, so they couldn't be used anymore. Now, you think in this case, nice, maybe, but it's, it it's, might be a bit scary that someone in an office somewhere can just lock down tractors in other parts of the world, yeah? And what if it would be hacked, yeah? Um, so there are problems around data capture and surveillance. Also about workers, finally about sustainability. Um, yeah, will digital technologies, I, I pose it more as a question in terms of time, uh, will it be a solution for the many environmental challenges? Would it be a kind of utopia like this? Like technology nicely coinciding with nature, small scale, bi biodiversity, all kinds of crops? Or is it more like this, yeah? Increased monoculture and destruction. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Oana Visser, for your talk. I think you gave a really interesting overview of what's happening already, and, uh, but also the risks uh, that we have to be aware of. Um, there's no time to ask questions anymore, so keep them for the end, then we have plenty of time uh, for you, uh, for your questions. So for now, the next speaker, um, it's Amanda Carsten. She is Assistant Professor of Philosophy here at Tilburg University. Uh, especially uh, her focus is political philosophy and the ethics of violence uh, and nonviolence. And she also addresses top topics in animal ethics uh, as well. Um, and today she will give uh, a small talk about an ethical critique actually into uh, lab grown in vitro meat. Uh, posing that it's not actually an ethical solution. So please give a big applause for Amanda Carsten. <clears throat> all right, can you hear me all right? It's working. Great, thanks. Thanks very much for the invitation. Very pleased to be here. Um, I wanted to start off by saying I'm, I'm a philosopher. Uh, surprise. But uh, my initial training, actually right out of high school, was biotechnology. Uh, 
I was going to save the world's problems by, uh, by science and technology. Um, very motivated by the, the potential uh, of science and technology to make the world a better place. I still think that, so it's not like I changed my mind on that. Uh, I did move away from biotech, uh, partly, I couldn't articulate it at the time, but a bit of a frustration with how to think about some of these problems. Um, in particular, a lot of them seem to be of our own making, the problems that we were trying to fix. Uh, and I suspected that part of the underlying problem was how we think about the world, how we think about how to treat each other, uh, that that generated a lot of the problems that we then tried to use technology to fix. So I'm happy to be here today um, to share how I think philosophy adds something to that story, um, how it can complement our efforts in science and tech uh, to get a clear view of our problems and their sources. Today I am going to look at a, uh, a particular focus on a specific uh, technology uh, that has been um, touted as one of the problems, uh, sorry, one of the solutions to a problem, um, and dig into it a little bit from a philosophical uh, perspective. So this is in vitro meat is uh, my topic for today. First of all, uh, what is it? What are we talking about? Uh, it's also called cultured meat sometimes, uh, or uh, lab meat, or part of a cellular agricultural movement. It's the production of meat products via tissue culture technology. Here is a helpful uh, infographic about the, what this uh, consists of. You start uh, with a live animal. Uh, a pig, for example, and take a biopsy. This, uh, the animal still lives. This is a um, relatively painless uh, procedure. Extract some muscle tissue, some cells, uh, and then uh, use some enzymes and other treatments to convert those into stem cells. Uh, or you can uh, use embryonic uh, cells as, instead of this biopsy procedure. And then you proliferate them. Um, this is the, the lab part, uh, either in a, a big uh, um, tank currently that, that's being worked on right now, but that's the idea. You mass produce uh, these cells. Uh, then you want them to look a certain way and act a bit like muscle cells. So you would uh, place them on some scaffolding. This trains them so they become more muscle-like. And then there's, of course, processing. The result still needs to be mixed with other materials, dyes, additives, etc., to get something that looks like meat at the end of the day. Um, this is not science fiction. Uh, this is really, at least at some level, happening. Um, at least a 20-year history so far. In 2002, the first lab-grown meat was eaten. This is a very small scale. They had, you know, one petri dish size uh, of meat, and it was goldfish tissue uh, initially. Apparently that's easier to grow, I don't know. 2008, uh, PETA, the uh, People for Ethical Treatment of Animals, uh, animal rights organization, actually offered a $1 million prize to the first company to produce lab-grown chicken meat by 2012. So they're really on board with um, this movement. 2013, the first lab-grown beef burger was produced and eaten in London. This one burger was incredibly expensive. Um, again, the amount of energy and effort to produce a burger's worth of meat is quite substantial. Um, and today, there are, uh, in the last five years or so, quite a lot of corporate interest uh, in, in investment in uh, making this work. There's a couple of companies, if you're interested, to look up what they're offering. Now, of course, why, why develop this? You might already have guessed what some of the proposed benefits are uh, of producing meat in this way instead of the old-fashioned way of in an animal uh, first. So there's lots of, um, the motivation here is a lot of ethical benefits of producing meat in this way. I thought I would um, show you this screenshot. Uh, this is from uh, the Just 
eat just, uh, or is it just eat? I get it mixed up each time. They produce this good meat um, uh, product, or they're, they're aiming to. And this is a, a slide from their website. I'm not being sponsored by them. Um, I just thought it showed it well. Um, and this really captures what the, their message is, why this is such a good thing. So we'll always eat meat. To share the planet together, we have to do it differently. And they claim to produce or be able to produce meat without harm. Harm here meaning, of course, ha harm to the animals uh, involved in meat production. Uh, but also you can see from the picture, they're suggesting environmental damage uh, associated with uh, regular um, livestock farming um, and also um, human health as well. So I'm going to uh, summarize uh, briefly what some of the common ethical um, arguments are around the production of uh, this in vitro meat. Uh, these, these focus around these three main themes are sort of human health, the planet, and animals. On the human health side of things, uh, in vitro meat has been thought of as a way to better control and protect humans from certain zoonotic diseases. These are diseases that, that move between different species. Um, so you're taking different, you can control their environment a lot better uh, and test uh, products before they're uh, consumed. Uh, you would uh, reduce or even eliminate the need of uh, using antibiotics in uh, industrial farming. You could also, I mean, the lab is this wonderful place. You can control so many things. So perhaps you could even control the cholesterol level uh, in the meat product uh, or tweak different nutrition factors uh, of the final product. Sounds all good. A um, couple quick things. Um, it's currently quite expensive, uh, these meat products. I mean, it's still very much in a development stage, um, but it is incredibly expensive. So the extent to which these health benefits would be enjoyed by humans in general, this would not be possible as it's gonna be rich people uh, who would be able to enjoy these benefits. Um, and as I mentioned, there's still a lot of processing that happens. It's not just sort of pure meat tissue. Uh, that is produced. It's mixed again with additives and dyes and other uh, stabilizers and things to produce a final product that looks and tastes and smells. Texture is something recognizable. So it's, it's, uh, that might reduce the sort of um, health benefit uh, picture of such meat. On the planet side of things, um, it's celebrated as a, um, a way to reduce the carbon output associated with the production of meat. Uh, you don't need to cut down uh, rainforests to make um, pasture uh, for livestock. Um, this looks like a, a really good uh, reason to pursue in vitro meat. Uh, currently, this is not um, uh, uh, been achieved. Uh, so the current productions, they've not been scaled up yet. Again, they're still at, at a development stage, but it's currently still quite energy intensive, um, the production of, of such um, products. And on the animal side, um, this is perhaps one of the, the most motivating points uh, for me. You eliminate the slaughter of animals. Um, you just need a biopsy or embryonic cells. You don't need to kill any animals to produce this meat. You eliminate uh, or at least reduce the, the suffering that's involved in the production of meat uh, from the animal side. Um, and uh, one of these companies even suggested it, it enables us to have a respectful attitude. Um, there's still lurking problems though with this claim uh, and that's the growth medium that the cells need uh, to multiply and, and grow um, has traditionally relied on what's called fetal bovine serum, which is what it sounds like. It's um, a serum produced from the blood of fetal bovines, baby cows. Um, and they've had a really hard time uh, finding an alternative that is not uh, derived from that source. So currently, um, there have been one or two companies that have claimed that they have an alternative, but I've, from what I've read, maybe we'll find out later if this is true, that this is an 
unsubstantiated claim or, or not quite perfect yet. But this, so this is still a, currently a problem. Okay. Now this quick overview uh, and the problems that I've hinted at so far in terms of the, the success of these ethical benefits of in vitro meat, a lot of these problems you could think of as, as technical problems. Like, yeah, it's currently expensive. Uh, yeah, it's energy intensive. Uh, but these are technical problems that with more, um, more research, more study, we can scale up and, and we can address these problems. These are not necessarily insurmountable. I want to raise one more problem, though, an ethical problem, which I don't think is the same kind of thing. It's not solvable uh, with just more technology. And that's a concern for our attitudes. OK. So as uh, Hannah said in her introduction, I'm, my, my aim here is to suggest that despite all these proposed ethical benefits, I think there are serious ethical costs and risks associated with producing something like in vitro meat. So I want to say that in vitro meat actually fails to address one of the fundamental problems uh, with meat eating and therefore does fail to be a satisfactory ethical solution uh, to the problem of meat eating. I'm going to do two things. First, I'm going to try and say what I think this fundamental problem is uh, with meat eating um, and suggest it lies in the attitudes uh, that it expresses uh, towards animals. And second step, I want to show that those attitudes are retained when we move from traditional meat to in vitro meat. And therefore, we have not solved the problem. All right. I should maybe preface this by saying I, I don't want to discount the incredible benefits of reducing or eliminating slaughter of animals and suffering. Those are important things. <laughs> I'm not going to say that those count for nothing, uh, but they don't count for everything. And I worry that there will be problems in other areas uh, if the attitude problem is not addressed. All right. So <laughs> quick <laughs> two-line summary of animal welfare ethics. Uh, animal welfare ethics uh, traditionally has centered on two main um, uh, avenues or uh, questions, issues related to how we might think about animals' ethical status. So we might be concerned about animals having certain rights, uh, and that might be why it's uh, morally wrong to treat them in certain ways either to eat them or use them in scientific experimentation or uh, in other ways. It might be, be, that might be wrong because they have rights not to be used in that kind of way. Um, or, and or, you might be interested in suffering. Uh, that what is morally wrong with certain practices is the pain and suffering that creatures undergo or experience as part of that process. Um, and on this, on either of these routes, it actually looks quite plausible that something like in vitro meat solves these problems, right? If um, animals have rights not to be killed or eaten or mistreated, we're not doing that anymore with in vitro meat. We take a small biopsy. It's really hard to say that that would be against uh, violating a right. Um, and same with suffering. We would be, if we can get rid of the fetal bovine serum part, we would be eliminating uh, the suffering criticism of uh, meat production. So on the ethical front, this looks promising. But my, my first goal here is to show you that there might be something more, another feature that's ethically or sort of morally relevant to our evaluation here. I'm going to do that by talking about two problems. One is to give you an analogy that might uh, prompt your intuitions to think that there's something more. Um, and one uh, discussion of eating people. It's not what you think, <laughs> so hang on. <laughs> Be talking about uh, uh, philosophical claims about why we don't eat people. Okay. So these are going to show, I hope, why we think there's something in addition 
to concerns about rights or concerns about suffering. So I'm going to start with the analogy. So here's the, the first, uh, this is the, the, the current suggestion of moving from traditional meat to meat star. Sorry, this is how philosophers talk sometimes, um, in vitro meat. If we do this move, we eliminate animal suffering that's currently required to produce meat. So tick on the suffering side. No animal's rights are violated. So tick, we've got rights covered. We've even got a sort of pragmatism point here covered in that, uh, and we hear this frequently, it's unlikely that everyone's going to adopt vegetarianism. So given that sort of practical reality, if you're concerned about animal eth ethics, um, then um, meat, moving to meat star, to in vitro meat, um, will avoid this sort of practical problem that humans aren't going to get on board with vegetarianism. So with, without meat star, People are still going to eat meat. Animals will still suffer. So we should go to in vitro meat. OK, so here's the analogy. So this is the current structure. Let's look at another example that follows the same structure. Um, let's talk about child pornography, as one does on a Thursday afternoon. So imagine we suggest moving from child pornography to digital child pornography, CP star. So, and this is, this is technically possible in lots of ways today uh, as well. So we produce pornography that looks uh, like children are involved, uh, but it's produced artificially through uh, digitalized images. If we do that, no child uh, will suffer in the production of that um, pornography. Um, of course, the suffering of children in production is a frequent criticism of why child pornography is bad. No children's rights will be violated if no one specific images are used. It's a generic uh, image, for example. Um, and we have a pragmatism point here as well, that despite our um, concerted efforts to eradicate child pornography, it persists. And perhaps we should pursue alternatives that address the current suffering that continues on without uh, this alternative that's available, that we could make available. OK, so what I'm hoping here is that your intuitions on the child pornography example are, oh, no, there's something still wrong uh, with digital child pornography. Um, I might recognize the reduced suffering, in it, and, but there's still something wrong uh, about people looking at children in this kind of way. So these are structurally equivalent, but the second I, I suspect many of you find morally abhorrent. It permits and encourages thinking of children in a certain way as objects for one's sexual gratification, which we think in general as a way of thinking about children is wrong. And I think this example helps to motivate the idea that our attitudes, how we think about a group or an individual, that that matters. And I'm hoping that this supports the, the um, similar view in the first case as well about in vitro meat. Our attitudes about animals might still be what matters. Uh, and I think the um, burden here is on supporters of in vitro meat to say what's relevantly different about these two cases. If you want to think, no, in vitro meat is still fine, you need to say what is different between these two cases. OK. So that's the analogy. Now onto the eating people point. <laughs> um, Cora Diamond, pictured here, uh, wrote a fascinating paper in 1978 called Eating Meat and Eating People. Uh, and she asks us to think about, we don't eat people. Why is that? And it's not because of rights or concerns about suffering. Uh, we don't not eat people because of we'd be violating some of their rights or concern about suffering. It's, it's something else. And she thinks it's because it's a consequence of thinking about people in a certain way, having this fellow creature response. She talks about, uh, she has this opening story. She, I think it's Orwell who talks about this naked soldier story, uh, fighting in the war. Uh, 
got the rifle out waiting for uh, enemies to appear. Enemy soldier pops up, but they were caught off guard and they have their pants down because they were um, going to the loo, uh, as it were, and is running across in a panic with their trousers around their ankles. And Orwell notes, I, it, it suddenly is a human. It's suddenly not an enemy soldier, some abstract entity that I can kill. It's a, it's a fellow human that suddenly it becomes really difficult to shoot at. And this is the difference between an enemy soldier who is killable and having this fellow, oh, it's a fellow creature that's a human that, ah, I can't have, I can't, it's not so killable uh, anymore. Uh, and that's why, that's the connection um, for why we don't eat people. They're not edible. That's not what we do to humans that we see as, as humans, as part of our fellow creaturehood. Um, this fellow creature response, as she describes it, is this feeling of being in a certain boat, as it were, as our fellows in mortality, in life on this earth. Uh, and that's uh, not having that feeling towards animals is what makes them edible for us and distinguishes animals from humans. We don't see animals this way, and that's why they are edible. We see them as edible. Almost done, if you're concerned about time. <laughs> All right, so this sense of animals as being edible as opposed to humans, this lack of a fellow creature feeling, um, this problematic attitude that I'm talking about, this is retained when we move from traditional meat to in vitro meat. Animals are still thought of as edible. That's the whole point of in vitro meat. Why are plant meats not enough? There's lots of great alternatives uh, available made from plants. Why the push for the, we, those aren't enough? We need, we need alternatives made from animals specifically. Um, the response is, well, those aren't real meat. What I need is actual from an animal because it's animals that are edible. And that's what's kept constant from the move from traditional meat to in vitro meat. So developing in vitro meat perpetuates the view that animals are edible. It doesn't force us to confront this lack of a fellow creature feeling. It continues, yet it's really important to grow this kind of cell culture because animals are for eating. So this blocks the fellow creature response. Um, I do think, sort of as a consequence of this lack of a fellow creature feeling uh, towards animals, does mean that animals will still be eaten. So the production of in vitro meat doesn't, I don't think will mean that there won't be animals slaughtered still for eating. Um, I think there'll be your in vitro meat option for some people and a luxury meat option uh, for uh, wealthy people in the same way that we currently have the differentiation between fake leather and real leather, or fake fur and real fur. The real fur, the real leather, these are the expensive, um, high status uh, options, right? The introduction of fake fur or fake leather has not eliminated the production of fur or leather. Um, and this absence of a fellow creature feeling for animals, which is tied to the thinking of them still as edible, I think will enable their continued poor treatment in other domains, uh, like in scientific testing, in sports, uh, in disrespect for their habitat needs, uh, etc. Okay, so just to quickly wrap up, I wanted to say the point here is to say in vitro meat um, does not address this problem, despite all the sort of other ethical tick boxes that it manages to address. It does not address the fundamental problem with meat eating. Uh, and in that case, I think it fails to be an ethical solution. I do want to suggest at this last stage a, a sort of stronger claim. Not only does it not address it, I think it actually helps hide this problem uh, from us. Um, so it actually makes the problem worse, that we think we can be good animal lovers and eat this meat uh, without recognizing we've not changed our attitudes really towards animals. So it conceals this crucial ethical dimension 
by leaving our attitudes uh, unscrutinized. Um, and finally, uh, just a general comment, perhaps on the general theme of technology and food or any human challenge. Uh, I do think many, uh, many problems, of course, have technical and ethical aspects. Um, and we do need to investigate how these interact with each other uh, and how they're co-produced. Uh, and remember, of course, that many ethical problems are, are tied to how we think about others uh, and how that translates into how we treat others. And technology can make it easier uh, to confront this dimension, um, or it can make it easier to hide from this uh, dimension of our activities as well. So that's it for now. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you very much, uh, Amanda. I think uh, it's really an interesting perspective and a good perspective to, you know, br the people bring this solution up as a really good ethical solution for uh, meeting or meat eating and also killing animals. But that it sometimes is really important to also think further if that's uh, actually the case. So, uh, and we will address the questions from the audience. So if you have any questions, uh, yeah, raise your hand. Um, to be honest, I have a lot of questions. We are not going to address all of them, I guess. Yes, yeah, so all speakers are here and uh, yeah. Okay, I can see a few questions already. So um, yeah, Julia will uh, give a microphone. Um, thank you for the insightful presentations. So my question is, at the moment, the UN has estimated that the world population is heading towards 10 billion by 2050. And um, we don't have enough arable land to like continue farming for the growing population. So there's been an introduction, well, growing topic of new um, genome techniques in plant breeding. And I'm really curious, maybe if any of you can shed some light on that and maybe the sustainable um, impact of it and your thoughts from your respective backgrounds. The question is not completely clear to you, uh, the, especially the, the last one, two sentences. I couldn't. Uh... I would like to. I'm wondering if you have any insights to share on new genome techniques in plant breeding from your um, various backgrounds and how maybe that relates to sustainability because it's like a new innovation in um, agricultural technology and it's, I, I think it's sustainable. So I'm curious if you have um, encountered any topics or any discussions regarding it and how it can help. Like you mentioned, for instance, um, the economic challenges as well to agriculture and and, and it's a lack of land, right? Yes, because of how lack to, of how land. How to solve so this the is, issue yes, so the land. This, yeah, so I think um, I have a couple of remarks. First, the the, the statement that uh, or the assumption that um, there is not enough land uh, with normal crops that is still um, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that because there is still a lot of space to increase production with without uh, GMOs because there are lots of big parts of the world where. There is a huge gap between what is being produced and what could be produced. Um, so I see uh, some problems with um, uh, the, um, the very optimistic views, which sometimes is given that yeah, GMOs, uh, GMO plants will be uh, uh, solve all those problems. Because uh, one is that often farmers uh, become then super dependent on a few uh, companies who have those patented uh, GMO plants and they are yeah, entering a kind of technological treadmill so uh, normally they can reproduce their own, own uh, uh, plants, their own seeds, they are not able to do that. Often the farmers are lured into that with subsidized uh, uh, seed, yeah? so it's, it seems to be uh, low cost and they enter it 
and once they are used to it and they are not able anymore, they've forgotten how to reproduce the seeds, prices go up and they cannot keep up with it. So to me, it's not in often it's not such a sustainable solution as uh, as proposed. And you see, for example, in in India, uh, yeah, huge uh, farmer suicides, for example, they are getting indebted and uh, dependent. Thank you. We had another question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you to all the speakers for speaking here today. And I had a question for the second presenter. Um, yeah. Um, so if I understood correctly, your uh, perspective was that um, the fundamental uh, issue of seeing animals as being there for slaughter and for consumption is the main issue with the uh, um, lab-grown meat. And so I wanted to ask kind of regarding the scenario that popped into my head um, with a plant-based meat mm -hmm. um, that right now the texture is still not fully there. It's obviously still plant meat. But if in the future, in a couple years, a couple decades, the um, plant-based meat um, improved and it looked exactly like a normal steak would, um, would that be a possible solution to the fundamental issue that you brought up? Or would the fact that um, the source is different still not necessarily solve it because the fact that it looks exactly like real meat would still kind of demeans the life of the animal? That's it. <clears throat> Excuse me, very good question. I grapple with this uh, myself. <laughs> so I do think what really matters is, like, if someone gave me what looked like a steak, what would really matter to me that it's not actually from an animal. It can look and taste perhaps differently, but it, it's really important to me that it's not from an animal. I do think a lot of the um, plant-based meats um, there's a market for things looking a familiar way uh, and being acceptable with for any friends and family that they'll eat it too. Uh, so I, I think it doesn't necessarily have, it doesn't, well, it's importantly doesn't have the animal connection, right? That's what, that's a selling feature. It tastes certain ways, but it's not uh, from an animal. Um, and I think that that's really important. Um, the familiarity with certain kinds of textures, tastes, or, you know, food is very culture-based of what you expect to see on a plate. Uh, th that's quite a, yeah, a complex uh, series of concerns. So I, th I think it would be okay. I think that would help break the, again, as long as it's what is the selling feature about it is that it tastes great and everything. It's not an animal, and that's why you want this food. Um, I do have pro other problems with plant-based meats just because they're so resource intensive and we could, they're a very inefficient way of using uh, that plant material. But as a go-between, it's okay, yeah. Thank you. Um, does anyone else has any question? Um, because I actually have a question for Yulia. Uh, so you talked how this uh, artificial milk is produced and if we want to mass produce, uh, how much resources do we actually need for that? Because when people talk about sustainability, I think many times they don't take into account how much data requires resources of storing, analyzing, and like even to have the labs like this. Uh, do you mean resources with this? respect to research or for the input of... No, if, if you actually mass produce uh, yeah, artificial meat or like you, of course, know more about dairy okay. products, but if you mass produce it, like how much resources are we talking about? Uh, that depends. I think once you scale, you can be more and more effective. At the moment, if you have a mini fermenter, like <laughs> really small, tiny things, at least that I saw with my collaborators, then you also have a lot of waste because you're not really precise in producing I think once it's scaled, you need not much land to place the fermenter. It can be anywhere in a, I don't know, in a basement somewhere. So it, it's independent of the climate. So you can also put it in the Arctic if you like, but the resources for the feed are still high. So that's, I cannot say a number for this. The input is necessary for, you need nitrogen and carbon to grow or, or gas or anything else to grow the microbes. Um, since I'm not the fermentin, uh, fermentation expert, I cannot really say, but there are resources necessary. 
Yeah, yeah. And uh, do you think that it would be like also produced by companies or like in the ideal case scenario? Because I know like there are those also sci fi scenarios where every one of us could just like produce any product for ourselves. Yeah, I could imagine more that maybe farmers are producing it, having fermenters on their farms producing maybe sugar beets and then the sugar just goes directly in, keeping the transport as low as possible to leave everything on site and then happy animals around it, which still have a, a existence. Um, and yeah, but there, there are these uh, ideas how this could look like in the future. Yes. So talking about the uh, farmers in our presentation, that was a very nice model of uh, digital innovation, right? Uh, but I can imagine that there are like a few countries that actually lead this innovation. But what about those countries that are actually kind of left behind? Like what is the gap and how can we bridge this gap between uh, countries that actually lead this technology innovation and who are kind of left behind? Yeah, you see that is, of course, uh, the US and the EU, they are leading it and uh, a bit in Japan. Uh, so we see that uh, there are there is now a drive to develop also um, a kind of uh, digital agriculture for um, the global south, uh, for example, in Africa and Asia. Uh, and then it's much more, it's not about combines and tractors and milk robots, but it's more like cell phone based, like um, information via uh, platforms and, uh, and and through cell phones uh, so they get information uh, and sometimes combined with for example soil sensors uh, so that that is uh, is emerging uh, but yeah there is a huge gap and also within the west there is a, a, a big gap yeah some farmers have the resources to to do it and if they are the front runners they they get subsidies and etc and for others, it's much more difficult to uh, to do that. Yeah. So there are big gaps both within the West and across the world. Uh, yeah. So do you actually think that this technology making this gap bigger or like smaller? Especially like, I mean, for example, with artificial meat, right? It costs like a lot. So do we actually just increasing the gap between those people who can afford like to eat like good food, right, or uh, biological food? or it's opposite? Yeah, the proponents say, okay, so like uh, countries in Africa do what they call then, yeah, like leapfrogging, yeah? They can uh, skip, for example, with cell phones, they skipped the base, the, the phase of landlines and got immediately to cell phones. So uh, that is the positive take on it. But if you look, for example, like who really uh, gets the value of this, who makes money then, most of these platforms, which are now operating in Africa, they, it's like private equity from uh, from London, from the US. And then uh, one I studied in Proxima Ghana says like it's digital agriculture for Africans, by Africans. But if you look a little bit further, then uh, it's all uh, Western money, for example. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I know we are running out of time, so I will just ask the last question for uh, Amanda. So uh, how do you think like when technology goes wrong, right? Who is actually liable for that or who would be like maybe from ethical point of view, right? Is it like those who produce or like, for example, farmers who use it? So how do you think how can we address this issue? Because like, yeah, if no one knows what's going on, like who would be responsible when things go wrong? You mean wrong as in like there's a big accident? Or yeah, yeah, something like that, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, this is actually uh, something that you raised, uh, I think, in your talk with the, the language, the wording that Ed has chosen. Reminded me that like you work at a university, public funds, but this is also a corporate market, right? So yeah. I do think responsibility is uh, an important uh, question. Um, and maybe to help think about who is involved with developing the technology um, from like a research standpoint and then what happens with it on the market. Uh, food is obviously an important market in a capitalist society, but it doesn't have to be treated as, oh, sorry, this is going bigger. <laughs> I should maybe <laughs> stick to this original question. Uh, it was important to be clear on that at the beginning, right? So 
there's a legal framework, um, but there's also who might be morally responsible. These things can come apart. Um, but yeah, you don't want to have a problem and then start wondering where to point uh, fingers. Um, so to be clear about where it, it lands. Yeah, to address it in advance. Earlier, yeah. yeah. But there will always be surprises, right, of things you hadn't anticipated. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much uh, to all our speakers. I think uh, Hannah will uh, give the last word. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, and we hope we addressed uh, all your questions. Thank you. All right, definitely. Uh, I think we have to... Uh, all right, a really quick one then. Yeah. <laughs> so... Um, um, uh, Dr. Visser said something about eel mapping, um, how, uh, like the, with the AI, you can predict the, um, how much yield you're going to get from the farm. And, um, I assume that is used by the farmers to forecast like the prices and then to compete with, um, the foreign market or like the other competitors. Uh, but what do you think about the future of like this technology when um, when it's used with the platform because uh, from where I'm from, I'm from South Korea and uh, they use, when they use like these kind of big data, data driven technologies with the platform, uh, like they usually go downhill. Like to give an example, we have an equivalent of Dice Resort in the Netherlands where they use big data to predict um, like the uh, what the customers want and uh, how to gain more customers based on the advertisements and not many after some while after using them restaurants stopped using them because the amount of money that they were paying to the uh, platform was way more than what they were gaining from actually using that technology and uh, people like the restaurant owners started boycotting and um, yeah, after a while, like the business uh, with that big data, like uh, went downhill. So what's your opinion? Like you said, uh, those data driven technologies can either lead to a doom or like a really nice uh, optimistic think, future. But sorry what's your personal opinion on that? Sorry to interrupt you, but we're really over time. So uh, I think we should uh, answer this question. I mean, it's like in one sentence, like, I mean, it's fine. Um, yeah, there, there, there are definitely big, big, big uh, risk. So um, what I think that, that with those technologies, it's all about the political constellation around it. Yeah, whether it will benefit the farmers and us as consumers or it will benefit just a, a group of big tech platforms and providers. So the technology, it's more about who, what is the business model behind it? Is it more open source? Is it a few big tech farms? That is in the end uh, super important. Thank you. I don't know if speakers are going to stay like for a few minutes. So if you really have any questions, maybe you can come up uh, later and ask them directly. So I will give the floor to Hannah. So now uh, for real, of course. Um, we really have to end it here. Thank you all for listening. It was really great that, you're, that you were here. Uh, also for uh, our online listeners, thank you for, uh, for being here today. Um, and um, actually, I'll switch this on quickly. Um, if you could fill in this uh, quick uh, one minute QR questionnaire on your way out, that would really be great because we can learn a lot from, uh, from your experiences. So uh, thank you very much and um, we'll see you uh, during uh, one of our next events. Have a nice day.